But we begin the show with our first guest of the day, right out of the gate. It's Tucker Carlson, host of Tucker Carlson Tonight on Fox News Channel, also Tucker Carlson Today and Tucker Carlson Originals on Fox Nation. His latest Originals documentary we'll get to here in just a moment. You can access Fox Nation for free for 90 days by going to TuckerCarlson.com. And Tucker, welcome back to the show. Hey, Guy. Thanks for having me. I'm delighted to have you here. Let's just play a little clip. This is the promo that's running of this latest documentary at Fox Nation that uh, you have produced, Cut 31. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Blake Masters. This may be the most significant midterm elections of our lifetime. For months, our team was able to embed with the Masters campaign. I'm trying to show people what a new breed of politician looks like. I know it's going to be hard, but damn it, this is important. And so I feel called to do it, even if I'm just a kid from Tucson, Arizona. Tucker Carlson Originals, the candidate, Blake Masters, streaming now, exclusively on Fox Nation. All right, Tucker, so Blake Masters is a guy we've had here on the show back when he was seen to be kind of a long shot. He's coming up again later in the week. We're going to have him as a guest once again here on the program. You guys have been embedded with him for a while. What was it about Blake and his campaign that made you select him as the candidate to trail? Well, I knew him before. Uh, I mean, if I guess I could sum it up in one sentence, you know, having spent my entire life, more than 30 years working around politicians, they're just not impressive people for the most part. They're really not. They've got bad values. They're sad, unhappy personal lives. You know, there are some exceptions, but they're not people really you'd want to have dinner with, by and large, and I've had a lot of dinners with them. Masters is like a legitimately interesting, smart person. He's a reader. He's a man of faith, a family man. Legitimately, he had a successful business career. But more than anything, he's grappling with what all these changes our society is going through mean. And how do you respond to them? And that's something that I've just long been impressed by. So I knew him already. Um, He gave us the access. But more than anything, I have been desperate to be excited about anybody in American politics, particularly at the statewide level. Um, And I'm genuinely excited about the prospect of what he'll do. And I never feel that way. I really do have contempt for them. I wish I didn't, but I do. (laughs) I mean, fair enough. But he's an exception to that rule. And what's interesting is when you guys and the, the camera crew and the whole production team started down there, and I sort of alluded to this a moment ago, It was one of those races that people were saying maybe it's a second or third tier possibility if the wave gets big enough, maybe a guy like Blake Masters, sort of a flawed candidate, first time guy, you know, candidate quality issues. Maybe he somehow gets across the finish line. But Mark Kelly's got this big lead and all this money and that race is kind of looking over. Well, I mean, these days that is not the case at all anymore. I think Masters has overperformed that conventional wisdom. I think I think his debate performance was was really strong. The one shot he had at Mark Kelly, that's just from, uh, to my eyes, he did very well in that debate. And I saw a poll out today, he's tied, despite that huge cash disadvantage he's been faced with in Arizona. I mean, this might be a, a pretty dramatic comeback story that you guys are reporting on. So I always thought he was going to win because his views match those of the Republican electorate. And that's the basic problem in Republican politics, I've always thought, leaving aside my own views. You know, I've got all kinds of eccentric views that are not majority views, but a political party should represent its voters. Like That's the whole point of democracy. It's a representative government. The people rule, and they do so through their representatives. And at least in the – I can't speak to the Democratic Party. I'm not a Democratic voter, but I know the Republican leadership. I know them all pretty well. They're not that interested in what their voters think. Their views on the big issues, war and peace, the economy, are very far from their own voters. Their voters vote for them by default because they're afraid of the other side. And it's just this terrible disconnect between the voters and their members of Congress. And I felt from day one, in fact, before he announced, just when I knew him as a person, that his views were consistent with the majority of the Republican electorate, and even in Arizona. So... Yeah, I'm not surprised at all. Everyone hates him in Washington, of course, because you know exactly what his life in the Senate is going to be like. He's not going to go along with Mitch McConnell or whatever. I mean, I'm sure you know everyone's, everyone's pretending he's going to, but he's like a totally different kind of Republican. I, I personally happen to agree with him on the issues, but even if I didn't, I would think, you know, we need a little diversity in this party. Not everybody can be 
you know, the same kind of Chamber of Commerce neocon moron. Like, we have enough of that. You know, we need a new flavor. And you think he's going to win? Oh, I've always thought he was going to win. Yeah, for sure. And then, you know, there are other things going on. I mean, the move in the Hispanic numbers is crazy. And Arizona is very heavily Latino, as you know. And, um, you know, that was always a huge problem for Republicans. But a lot of Latino voters have moved right, like pretty dramatically right, like a faster reset than I've ever seen in any group, big block of voters ever, maybe than there's ever been. And, um, you know, that that helps him. And it's it's just so funny, like in D.C., everyone's like, oh, you, know, you can't criticize immigration or Latino voters won't vote for you. Really? You, <laughs> it's just the opposite, actually, like pandering to people, treating them like some, you know, boutique racial group with its own specific set of interests that are different from everyone else's talking about salsa during you know, just, just basically being a guilty white liberal loser that turns voters off like there are many hispanic candidates who are strongly for border security just because they're americans why wouldn't they be you know what i mean mm-hmm. and um and so i've never thought you know you hear people say oh well he's tough on the border you know mexican americans won't vote for him i don't see any evidence of that at all yeah, I mean, look what's happening at the border. Look, look what's happening in South Texas and the realignment down there in politics. I mean, to your point, Tucker, I got to move to another Senate race. Did you happen to catch last night's debate out of Pennsylvania? Yeah. I mean, it was actually live during my show, but I watched it later. And I was really, you know, I felt bad for Fetterman, to be totally honest, and angry at his wife for allowing this. You know, I've been married for more than 30 years, and if I tried to do something like that, my wife would be like, no, I love you. You can't do that. You can't run for Senate. You're brain damaged. What? No. And, like, where's his wife? Honestly, I thought it was humiliating. It was awful. I cringed. I mean, I don't like Fetterman. I don't support his views or whatever, but I'm a human being, and I just I hated watching that. Um, but I also thought it said something pretty ominous about the Democratic Party. It's like, why would you run a guy like that? He had a stroke in May. Like, they've known this a long time. It's a Democratic-leaning state. They could have swapped in somebody else. They had time. They didn't. And it it really makes you feel like they don't care. Like they think that they've got the system so wired. They own the media. They own the tech companies. They control the national conversation. They can run a mentally defective guy and get him elected. That's a very bad attitude. That's not a a Democratic attitude. That's an oligarchical attitude, and I, I just don't like it at all. I mean, to me, it's a story about him and his health. And I mean, I agree with you on his record and his viewpoints. He is one of the least appealing candidates to me personally that I've seen in a very long time in American politics. And I've been very outspoken about that for a number of reasons. Uh, Like you, I have compassion for him and his situation. I hope he fully recovers. He clearly has not even come close to fully recovering. And yet we've been sort of told for a while now that, oh, he's coming right along and he doesn't have to release the records because, you know, that's too much. But look, he's he's appearing at events and his wife says he's fine and he occasionally says a few words and here's a doctor's note or what have you. Lefty journalists saying, oh, we've spoken to him at length and, you know, this, this NBC woman was lying about he can't make small talk. They all piled on her for giving just a tiny sliver of the truth about him, obviously. Uh, this is not just about him and his campaign. It's also about a national media complex that I think sort of set up this really tough to watch moment last night through omission, lies of omission, exaggeration, or just sort of looking the other way. That's my view. It's a really, no, I think it's a really smart point. Um, they lied about it. They're totally corrupt. I spent my whole life in this. My dad was in it. I always thought it was an honorable business. I, you know, none of my children would ever go into journalism because it's just so disgusting. And everyone knows it's corrupt. And it's, now it's just very obvious. Charlotte Alter of, quote, Time Magazine, which I was surprised to learn still exists, comes out yesterday with these tweets like, oh, I talked to Fetterman. He's actually pretty good in person, but, you know, he's not good in large groups. He won't be good. You know, like she's just reading the campaign talking points over Twitter. She's just mm-hmm. openly shilling. She's supposed to be a reporter. What a hack. And so many of them did that. And anyway, the, the whole thing, I agree with you. It's just deeply revealing, like. This is an impressive country. It's a huge country. It's a continental country, 340 million people. You should have impressive candidates run for the, you know, the most powerful legislative body in the world. You shouldn't put up John Fetterman. You know, you also shouldn't have Dianne Feinstein in the Senate. She's totally senile and everyone knows it. Her own staffers say it. And they're protecting her, too. It's like it's not even about the person. Again, I I said you said the same thing. You feel sorry for the man. And I I Mm -hmm. mean that. 
But what about the country he's supposed to be leading? You know, it's like no one even cares. It's about his personal journey of recovery. Well, okay, I've got a personal journey of recovery, too. I'm not going to bore you with it. Do you know what I mean? It's not about him. It's about the rest of us. And um, I just think the whole – it's just like, ah, it's a window into the narcissism and the cynicism of the establishment. It really is. Well, and now they're trying to gaslight us like, oh, well, maybe it wasn't really so bad and the campaign's blaming the closed captioning, which I'll get into. We're going to have some of the audio of this debate a little bit later on this hour. And then now the big talking point is it's ableist and cruel and bullying to even notice what happened last night. Like, it was just undeniable. It's right in front of our faces. Like, well, it's cruel to talk about. And Dr. Oz is a bully. I, it's just, it makes your head spin. Wait, it's a, that's so, I'm, I'm a little out of it. Um, I just took my dogs for a run, so I'm, I've, I haven't, I've been <laughs> out of it for the last two hours. You're better but, off. Trust me, uh, you're better yeah, off. I mean, I'm. I'm a little surprised people would even say that. I mean, I guess I shouldn't be surprised by anything at this stage, but but I mean, it's like it it tells you though they don't even care what voters think. I mean, I just I had this thought last night as I'm reading about this and this morning as I'm watching it, you know, they're going to tell us you know, the Wednesday after the election that he got 81 million votes and you're going to be like required to believe it or something. It's like if, if the only way you would run a candidate like that is if you thought you couldn't lose. And I think that's really creepy. Like in a democracy, you should just be very aware at all times of what voters think and always trying to please them, always trying to represent their best interests. You shouldn't like shove senile candidates down the throat of voters like they did in the last presidential election like they're doing in this one. I think they should be punished for that. Like. There are plenty of smart liberals who I disagree with, but who are still, you know, obviously pretty impressive people. Why not competent. run one of those? Yeah, competent Fetterman. Not only, and I, I don't want to seem like I'm mocking his injury. I feel bad for him, but he's also stroke aside an utterly unimpressive person. No, that's who right. Was on, you know, he's like this self-indulgent rich kid who lived off of his parents until his mid forties. Who's done nothing. He was the mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania one of the most screwed up towns in the entire Commonwealth. And it got no better as mayor. And he ginned up all this publicity about how he's putting in art galleries or whatever, and then just left the place, the shambles that it remains. And it's well, like, and then he became Lieutenant governor of the whole state and didn't show up for that job. You know, most of the time, it's a sort of this, this ridiculous story that is even close to a Senate seat. Tucker Carlson, we only have a little bit of time left, but I do want to play you one more soundbite. This is from a different debate last night, New York gubernatorial debate, a very interesting exchange between Kathy Hochul, the incumbent Democrat, Lee Zeldin, the Republican, challenging her on crime. This is the issue on which Zeldin and the Republicans are surging in that state. Listen to cut 26. This governor, who still to this moment, we're at, what are we, halfway through the debate? She still hasn't talked about locking up anyone committing any crimes. Okay. Anyone who commits a crime under our laws, especially with the change they made to bail, has consequences. I don't know why that's so important to you. I don't know why that's so important to you, locking up criminals and keeping them locked up. I don't know why that's so important to you. She said sort of incredulous to Lee Zeldin. Your thoughts, Tucker? I mean, I thought she was an utter fraud since she got that job without being elected when they ran Cuomo. I, I never liked Cuomo, but like, what did he do wrong exactly? No one can even remember. That was such, an, such a scam, that whole thing. Um, but what really strikes me is Lee Zeldin, who I've known for a while, and, like, you know, he's kind of your garden variety Republican. I don't know what happened to Lee Zeldin, but he became, like, really good. Like, I don't know. You know, sometimes <laughs> the pressure of a campaign changes a person and makes him more impressive or less impressive, you know, pressure changes people. And Lee Zeldin became way better at explaining what he believes. His beliefs became sharper and more relevant. Like he just became a really good politician in the process of this race. I'm like, I had him on the other night. I was like, I couldn't believe it was him. And I, I didn't want yeah. to sound like patronizing or anything, but I, but I meant it. I wanted to say, holy smokes, Lee Zeldin. You're killing it. I never thought you could be this good, but he is. And I think he well, yeah, and I guess he had right this this galvanizing issue that is clearly 
personal to him and, and got very close to home recently for him, and he's running with it. He's hit a stride. She's flailing. It's still a very, very blue state, so I'm skeptical, but I don't think New York Democrats were expecting to be sweating at all at this point of the race, and looks like they are at the moment. Tucker Carlson, our guest, Tucker Carlson, tonight, every weeknight at 8 p.m. on Fox News Channel. You can check out this new documentary series, The Candidate Blake Masters, out now, foxnation.com. You can check Fox Nation for free, a little 90-day trial, by going to TuckerCarlson.com. That's one of your options right there. Tucker, great to talk to you. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks a million, Guy. See ya. We will step aside. We will come right back. Just getting started on The Guy Benson Show. 